to say that this is as good as it gets, that we, that we still preserve this, generous, this gender essentialist notion of man and woman as being the only two mutually exclusive, exhaustive possibilities for social identification, despite the fact that there's this huge flexibility that we get from the linguistic exchange within the community. Um, we still preserve within members of the community this, this problem, and I talk about in the paper all the problems that, it, that entail becoming a woman or a man, post-op, right? You have to be diagnosed as pathological, it's a, it's a humiliating affair, it's ridiculous, and if there's anything that I'm going to champion is getting rid of that. Um, I don't think I have enough power to do that, but I'm making my stuff public, so somebody who has more power and is taking the time to watch me, first of all, thank you for watching my videos. <laughs> I talk a lot, <laughs> but I'm trying to make a change, right? It's like for people who get what I'm doing, people who understand this, you know, make, make some changes, right? Um, and I think we can really start to wake people up if there are more people who are willing to embrace this identity, right? Because then this identity shows that it's not just going to be man or woman, even though, even though we think that this is, is, uh, is uh, a refutation, um, an indictment of gender essentialism, and what ends up happening in this aspect of transgender theory is that there's conformity here. There's still conformity to the governing hegemonic power. It's only when we get to this level that we really truly recognize a third gender, right? We recognize this other, and there pa there's papers and research done on the third gender. My interpretation is a little different, but we recognize this third gender, right? Um, and, and, and hopefully we get to a point where we just, we do away with gender entirely. I doubt that'll ever happen, but, you know, it wouldn't hurt. So that's, that's the, uh, that's that. The last the last aspect is um, uh, a very very important aspect in recognition of identity. What I wanted to do is I started the lecture by talking about some of the misconceptions in core theory. Then we moved to talk about um, then I moved to talk about sort of identity formation and the complications in identity formation, and hopefully it's clear now, it should be very clear that there are many different ways about discussing identity and identity formation within a collective identity, queer, within queer theory. Um, but it's not that simple, right? You would think it's that simple, but we still in the background have the bad guy, hegemony, and the bad guy is heterosexual normativity, HMT. And the problem with heterosexual normativity is that heterosexual normativity is so forceful a power, it's so forceful a paradigm, if you will, that it wants you, if you are not heterosexual, remember we said that's a false identification, but just follow me, if you're not heterosexual, that you should just remain closeted, then don't say anything, and we'll just assume that you're straight. So this idea of being closeted comes up, and no one really does for me. Um, a better discourse on um, closetedness than, than obviously um, Eve Sedgwick, right? So uh, Sedgwick talks about, and she, she comes up with what's an, an amazing phrase, the epistemology of the closet. She does an epistemological deconstruction of the notion of closetedness. And it doesn't, I mean, it's, that's, I mean, kudos to her. <laughs> it's, it's insane, right? It's a, it's a profoundly deep, um, concept and just the, the the fact that she perceived that there is an epistemology uh, an epistemology of the closet is itself amazing. Um, I am not going to be able to go into the full epistemological deconstruction of the closet. I'm just going to give you a, a, a general idea. And the point is, even after we, as members within the queer community, identify ourselves as queer there is still another step in this identification process, and that's the coming out. Now I need to let other people know that I'm out. And there's tension to come out. And there's disagreement on why should I be forced to come out? What if I want to stay in? It might be to my advantage to stay in. You should all come out. Should other people force you out? And so on and so forth. There's this whole discussion, and what Cedric does masterfully is she talks about the epistemological, the, the conceptions of knowledge, how we come to know about the theoretical structure of the closet. I mean, profound, profound uh, research. So, first, so we're going to talk about the closet now. 
So C C L O S E T. So with respect to closet, the first thing that we do, first we recognize that queer theorists have shifted from the essentialist notions of identity to socially constructed notions of collective identity. And I just talked about that at great length, right? So there's been a shift um, within queer theory um, insofar as there's an anti-essentialist, there's a rejection of essentialist notions within queer theory, queer theory um, for embracing social constructionist, social constructivist notions. I would argue queer theorists need to go even further and reject some aspects of social constructionism, especially um, the, the assumption that gender is, is wholly male or uh, man or woman. And, and go for even more radical transgender theoretical notions, incorporate more changes into theory and queer theory. Um, so with respect to this idea of the closet, um, we recognize that there's a shift. So there's a shift from shift from uh, essentialists to uh, constructivists. So there's a shift from uh, essentialist to constructivist uh, conceptions. The next is, um, and this is what Cedric says, and this is really important, the idea of closetedness, the idea of being in the closet, it, it presupposes the dichotomy between homosexual and heterosexual, right? So anytime we talk about the closet, C -L -O -F, whenever we talk about the closet, right, it assumes that there is the dichotomy between homosexual and heterosexual, right? And that this is good and this is bad. Right? The idea of being in the closet presupposes the normativized heterosexual normativity that being heterosexual is good, homosexual is bad. So I go in the closet because it's bad to be homosexual. Who tells me that it t it's bad to be homosexual? Heterosexual normativity. And this complicates my identity formation, right? Because I, insofar as I'm in the closet, arguably, I haven't completed my recognition of myself, right? So um, heterosexuality becomes acceptable. This becomes the norm, right? As we said, this is accepted, right? Um, and that's 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 uh, that's very important. Barring social cues, identity is assumed to be heterosexual, right? Barring any social cues, if I see a random person on the street, person A, and he appears just like me, he talks just like me, he looks just like me you're immediately going to assume, bar none, that unless otherwise asked, that he is heterosexual. If you see a woman and she looks like a regular woman, no matter what class, no matter what race, um, no matter what religion, if she talks and she acts and conducts herself in a certain way, you're going to assume that she's heter heterosexual, right? So what ends up happening is heterosexuality not only becomes the norm, not only becomes um, assumed, it becomes the the default mode of identification, right? This is very, 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 very important, right? This is the default mode of identification. So the heterosexuality becomes a default mode of identification. I see a guy on the street, um, he looks like me, sounds like me, talks like me, you immediately assume he's heterosexual. Now, if there are cues, if there's social cues that the way I hold my wrist, the way that I talk, really generalized derogatory to cues, right? I'm wearing pink, you know, I, I do something different. Oh, well, he might be gay. But barring social cues, you're going to assume any person you see on the street, you're immediately going to default them to being heterosexual, which is problematic because now my identity is, without me even trying, in opposition to your assumption. So that when I tell you, oh, no, in fact, I'm gay, then you think to yourself, wow, I can't believe he's gay. You know, I didn't think he was gay. Well, you know, everything about him let me believe that he was straight. I, you know, you don't seem like that. You know, you get all of this, right? So that as far as identity formation, it's not only problematized by being in the closet, it's problematized by the fact that for any random person on the street, when they see you, they immediately default that you're heterosexual until you display social cues that identify you as homosexual or could possibly identify you as homosexual. With respect to homosexuality, um, then obviously this becomes deviant, D-E-V-I, right? It becomes unacceptable, right? It becomes, rather than the norm, it becomes deviant. Rather than acceptable, it becomes 